Hello, Julia. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Doing great. And it's good to see you again. And I'm going to share something. Okay. Oh, dear. Okay, I'm going to share something now. Okay. But, with the parrot and the cute. Yeah, so this is we can talk over this, I think. Okay. Um so this is my painting that I painted this week, not today. You know, you and I painted together today. Yes. But uh earlier this week I painted this gentleman from a black and white photo. His name is Talcott uh, Parsons, and he is a, a sociologist, a famous sociologist, um, and he's descended from Jonathan Edwards, wow. who is also an ancestor of. Uh, so sorry, let me off. Keep going. I'm so sorry. It's okay, if you need to take it. That's all right. No, no, no. I don't want to. I'm gonna. Um, you know. One second. I'm just going to unplug the phone because I didn't expect the phone to start ringing. So, sorry about that. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it, I decided to, to paint him, and this is a watercolor. And, of course, I've sped this up. I don't actually paint quite that fast. Uh, but I haven't sped it up as much as I did in some of the other films of it that you might have seen. Well, I, I like this piece because it's like it's not like too hectic because, OK, I do like speed motion, but sometimes I feel like when it has to be encapsulated into one of those really fast shorts, it can be kind of hectic in a way. So I kind of like this. It, it's fast enough that you can kind of see the progression, but it's not too fast. So it's a good moderate speed, I think. Yeah, I, I think so, too. So you can see how it goes and. Um, I'll tell you something about the technique and then you can tell me if you what, what you think about that. But basically it's because it was black and white. I didn't use a lot of colors. I mean, the original was black and white. Um, so I really didn't know what color to attribute to him other than the fact that he's a human being, probably has pink lips, you know, or reddish or dark red lips. Um, and he probably has some red around the rim of his eyes and things like that. So uh, basically, I started out with a very light uh, coat wherever I wanted it. And then I refined it by coming in, uh, either making it darker or adding that red there. That's cool. I mean, I like how you did the shadows. It's very it's a neat technique. Yeah, yeah. It's. I'm just learning that with watercolor, you don't want to go in too strong right at the beginning because you can't erase it. 
<laughs> so you want if you're not sure it's okay you can make a mistake but it has to be kind of faint you know mm -hmm. and then when you're a little bit more like confident like oh, i want this line then maybe you can kind of do more shading if you want right so it's basically the same technique that i've always had where i i correct myself as i go along i never get it right the first time but that's how i'm doing it with uh the watercolor and you can see i leave a lot of the paper just unpainted um yeah and that's the end of it so i guess we can stop sharing but yeah. i did enjoy seeing that that was really cool yeah so behind me over here i have um two paintings this one was from a while back and is based on a photo of you as a child yeah that was christmas 1989 when i got the porcelain doll so in that red dress with the floral three-tier skirt and the white cardigan i i love that outfit and the patent leather shoes i just love that outfit <laughs> Yeah, and I loved that photo, so I asked for your permission to to paint it, and um, I kind of liked how it happened. Uh, now, this is an acrylic painting, and I painted over it a lot. I don't know if you can tell, but there's a lot of paint on the surface, because every time I made a mistake, I just went over it with more paint, you know, until I was happy. I think it turned out really nice. So I, I really do like how that painting progressed. And I think you really captured the photograph. It's really cool. Thank you. So that was how many years ago was that now? Was that like three years ago? I mean, am I? Yeah, you know? no, I think you're right. I think it was. While. That was when you were starting to do the painting more, I think, right? You were starting to really get into the portrait painting around that time. Yes, I was. I think it was uh, 2019 um just before 2020 came around um and i had been to israel and then i came back and then i started painting a lot um so you know and i i really do like the way this one came out um but you know this year i decided i was gonna do um watercolor and watercolor is different. So this is the one that I painted today on the stream with you. And yeah, I, I love it. It's uh, me as a, a very small child. Um, and you can see again, just like with Talcott Parsons, I, I left most of the face unpainted. Um, it's just mostly white um, because, I, well, obviously I don't have terribly white skin or anything, but I just did not want to bother with with splotching it up with too much color where I couldn't control what kind of shapes it would make, you know? I think with water paint, that's probably a good approach, right? Less is more, like, with that medium? Yes. I mean, there's this woman that I follow who does portraits in watercolor. And she uses uh, masking fluid for the areas that she knows she wants to be white. But on the other hand, I think that she sketches in pencil first. She doesn't do this on the fly. And so she puts in a lot of time uh, for her work. And I do not. It took me... Uh, you know, on the show with you, it was about 30 minutes to do. Yeah, you were. I think that's really cool how you're able to do that a la prima style so quickly. But that that's the whole idea of a la prima painting, right? That you can create a painting in a half an hour or an hour, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it doesn't have to be specifically half an hour, an hour. But it, it means, you know, you're not going to be working on it for days and weeks and months or anything like that. But I, I do like the style and I love how you pulled it off. Well, thank you. Thank you. So I don't know that this is any better than that or any different from that. And I'm not sure if my paintings are progressing or this is just, you know, my ability level is this because, you know, they, these are different. This one is acrylic. This one is watercolor. I, I like them both. Um, I, I don't I don't know. What do you think? Uh, I feel like I've seen a progression. Like, I feel like you are much 
Like, I think that was a really good painting three years ago, but it seems like you have a really stronger concept of like where the eyes and like you do it more quickly. Like, it seems like you do like, did you create an acrylic painting in a half an hour back then? Could you do it? Back no, then? no, I didn't. Um, yeah, I think you're getting faster with more practice and time. And that's what they said. If you do it every day, which you were for like, what, a couple of years, right? Weren't you painting almost every day? Yeah, I that's was. A lot. That's a lot. And that's good practice. And I think I've seen an evolution in your style. I think you're getting better. Maybe you well, don't see it. I don't know. I don't see it. I mean, I, I it's not that I don't like my stuff. I'm not putting myself down at all. But I just don't see that I'm getting much better. You know, that's all. I mean, I don't think any of us are going to be like, unless somebody's like a master painter, like, well, like, you know, I mean, they said that if you put in the work and then you can uh, become better. You know, they didn't say I've seen that. I've seen you improve. I think you're good. I mean, I don't claim to be a master. There is very few people that are really at that level, though. We have to be honest. Your style is really good. I, I've seen people that don't even have as much skill as you that have paintings like on covers of books. So I think it's good. I think you're evolving and people do like it. Yeah. Well, OK. I, yeah, I wasn't asking for a whole, whole bunch of compliments. I'm just not seeing any, any okay. real change, you know. Okay. Um, but. I'm enjoying doing it. I, you know, I don't have a problem with it and I still like it. I, um, yeah, I got it. I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I have a lot of fun with it, but, um, and, and yeah, I, the thing with me is my feeling is if I put in, you know, some people think, well, you put, you, you did this in 30 minutes. What if you spent a whole day on it? What if you spent two days, but really, if I had spent any more time on that, I would have ruined it. I just would have because it was not getting any better. You know, you, you know what I'm saying? I get what you're saying. Like, I, I know you. that's your philosophy and it seems to work for you. Whatever works for you is what works for you. Yeah. I kind of, I'm the other way. Like, I do have to feel like I have to spend a lot more time on something for I, but where I'm happy with it. Or I'm not happy with it, but I have a different style too. Like I draw it out first and then I go in with color. So it's much different, you know? Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your technique. So right now you're working on the skin tone uh, of her face. Uh, do you want to share that? Well, I can share what I'm doing. So anyway, I've known about burnishing for a while, but just by looking online, Googling and basically reading things, some things I read in a book, actually from the library. Some things were from YouTube videos. I'm trying to improve my shading techniques. So a lot of what I've been told was what you want to do is just take like a colored pencil, like in darker colors, like burnt sienna, red, a little bit of orange, and you create like shadow points. So you kind of create like that depth. And then you go back over it with like this peach colored pencil. But the reason it works though with Prisma colors is because they're waxy. Like, oh, uh. Straight. Okay. So when you put this on paper, this one mm -hmm. will kind of like, it'll grind into the paper and become really smooth. One of the pencils that I'm using for burnishing is not like that. It's much harder. So I feel like Prismas are really good for me. Like I create that effect, but I didn't always have that effect. I like, I have a, a drawing book with some of my older work and I didn't use to like, make it really bold and really creamy like that it's evolved over time to where i just created that technique on my own mm -hmm. and i think the way i use it now is kind of the way people use oil pastel but i like colored pencil because it's a little bit um, smaller and you can get it more into like crevices and whatnot and i used to do some mixed media projects with oil, pastel, and colored pencil. But the only thing I don't like about colored pencil is the color fastness. And it fades over time a little bit. I don't like that. Yeah, there must be something you can do to preserve that. You know? I think you need to spray it like you were suggesting. I probably need to just buy that spray. That's probably the game-changing element to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although yeah. I do have one drawing. Like, it's an older one that I did in all Prisma from... 2013 like I can just show you like some differences like um like just a difference a few years like in 2010 
when I did a landscape, it was a little bit more, I didn't shade as um, quite as creamy as you can see right there. There was more of the texture of the pencil in it. You see the difference there, kind of? I, d I don't really, because you've got glass over it. So it's um, reflecting. Hard to see. Yeah, I know it's hard to see. But this one actually hasn't faded too much. Like oh. I, I'm surprised this is, it's faded a little, but not mm -hmm. as much as some of my older ones. So here was another thing I was thinking too. Maybe it wasn't Prisma colored pencils. I did have watercolor pencils I was accidentally using. And I think you're supposed to dilute them and use them as paint. And I was using them as colored pencil. And maybe those were the ones that were fading more. Oh, so well, that know. makes, that that makes a lot of sense. But for some reason, I really love those watercolor pencils at the time. Because I'm like, oh, they go on the page so nicely. But you're supposed to dilute them with water apparently. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can see how that would work. Yeah. We also had, what did we have? It was so specific, but they were really expensive. So we never bought them again. They were colored pencils with oil paint in them and you could use them for like pyrography. Like if you wanted to have an oil paint effect, but Ooh. oh my gosh, they are probably so much more now. And I couldn't see buying those all the time unless you're really into it and you're maybe selling something with that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, I, I don't know much about the pencils, but that all of that sounds really interesting, especially the one about watercolor, you know, that you add water to it. That's what the box said. But the weird thing was I was just using them as colored pencils. And then one day... I looked at the box and I'm like, well, this is watercolor pencils because I just had bought them. This was before I was migrating towards just wanting to use Prisma because I had some Prisma. I have some Prismas that are like from 1996. Those last a long time until they're gone. Like those pencils were a good investment. Although my mom said, I spent like $400 on all the art supplies I bought you. Like you better appreciate it, which I did because some of them, I still have some of those pencils to this day. Like they're very good grade of pencil. Um, I have a lot of those supplies, actually, a lot of those things. But yeah, they're a very wonderful pencil. But then after a while, I started buying more cheaper pencils, but I migrated back to wanting to use Prisma. But a few years ago, I wanted to start painting more, which I do want to paint more. And I feel like I need to be more forgiving of myself because I just feel like I need to take a lot of time on a painting or I'm not happy with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's just my own criticism of myself. I feel like kind of anxious if it doesn't look exactly how I want. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I, I think also you do have, your situation is different from mine because you do have good control over your hand-eye coordination. Mm -hmm. So you, um, you can uh, draw or sketch something and then color it in and have that work out. Okay. The reason, the reason I don't do that is because I don't have really good hand-eye co coordination. So what I'm doing is I'm using my eyes to try to figure out, is this right or is it wrong? And I have to forgive myself for the wobbly hand and everything else and just try to figure out how to make it look like what my eye tells me it needs to look like. And so that's why I can't, you know, separately draw it and then separately color it. I have to do both at the same time. At the same time. And that's actually what all the Prima painting is. And I mean, Bob Ross, he does that style. He was very famous for it. He, a half an hour, create a landscape. And a lot of people use that Ala Prima style. It is a thing. I just, I'm more of the school. Like, in fact, some people are like, well, why do you do a reference photograph when you paint something? I don't know. That's just the way I've always done it. I guess. Oh, I, I look at a reference photograph too. So no, no, no. Yeah. I mean, like, why do I draw it on the paper? Oh. Like an outline, okay. I guess I should say like, why do I draw the outline? Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, so okay. okay. why I do that. Uh, no, I understand uh, because you're very conscientious and you have control over your hands. And so you can draw a very beautiful drawing and then you can color it in very nicely. So, yeah. I mean, I enjoy doing that, but don't get me wrong. Like, it takes me a little bit of time. And, you know, when I, we were doing that art portfolio tour, the thing 
that I guess I didn't love about those classes is some people they're just really talented and they're really fast. Like they can create a very detailed sketch. Like they just sketch loosely, but then they keep going over it and over it. And in a half an hour, they have a sketch that's like amazing, immaculate. And I, it would take me like three hours to try and create something that might be a little bit on that level, but not really. And that was the thing I didn't love about the art classes is like, they always say you're in competition with each other. And I didn't want to experience art in that capacity, you know? Yeah, no, uh, art is a, an individual sport, not a competition. <laughs> Although yeah. nowadays they probably don't teach art that way. I think it was indicative of a different time. I'm sure it's not quite that way, but it probably still is because in the art world, people have like art, you know, con so I, it's hard to say. I didn't finish a degree in art, so I can't really specify. I just do art for fun on a level that I enjoy, you know? Yeah, well, same thing here. I don't have a degree in art. I'm not planning on getting a degree in art. I'm not planning to be, you know, a juried artist where all the other artists have to judge how I'm doing. I, I don't want to do that. You know who I really wish would go into art is my nephew. And he's really good. He's really talented. And I said a few times, I said, like, not you don't have to go to, like, a four-year university. But I thought he should study, like, some sort of commercial art. I really think he would do well with that, but he's kind of been like, oh, I just draw pictures for my friends for fun. And I said, I feel like he should be ch charging people for that, but that's just my take on it. I, I really wish he would look more into that, but you can't tell other people what they should do with their talent and time. No, no, you can't. I mean, maybe he has another career that he has in mind. Yeah. He's kind of said something else he wants to do, but I just, I guess I always saw him doing something with art because he is one of those people. He's very talented. He, I guess he's kind of like our great aunt who was a professional artist. And my dad still has this really beautiful um, drawing handbook. It was published in 1940 showing perspective. Like, and that's how I taught myself actually how to draw perspective was from that book. And it was hers. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, did you want to share some more uh, about the Hurem Sultan uh, drawing that you're doing and what you're doing with? Uh... I mean, I can explain. So, you know, you've seen the picture on Wikipedia. I kind of changed things around, like her headpiece in the Wikipedia, which is based on a Titian painting. And by the way, they say it's probably not a Titian original, but someone who painted in the school of Titian. So I'm like, he, and she never sat for the painting. This is what people need to remember. In fact, um, Ottoman princesses didn't sit for paintings until the 1800s when they were beginning to get, uh, yes, a lot of them are of European ancestry, but actual European influence when European painters started coming to court and being more accepted, which is funny because the uh, Magnificent Century has like a painter who was her, um, there's a whole sub story in there that's just not based on the history where harem sultan's like former lover from when they were abducted like shows up one day at the palace and he's going to paint the sultan and harem and it turns out like oh my gosh that's her ex-boyfriend and like it's a whole angle but they didn't even have european painters come in and paint the sultan or his wife or princesses until like the 1700s. So that was pretty hilarious. But anyway, um, so we don't know exactly what she looked like. We know she had red hair and the Titian painting, she's wearing the head high. Um, it's kind of like, it's hard to explain. It's a, it's not exactly like a witch hat, but it kind of slopes up like this. So their veil could kind of hang behind it. I need to look up the Ottoman Turkish word for it, to be honest with you. I've never done that yet, <laughs> but I will. Okay. And then, but one thing that's very um, interesting about those headpieces is they have a lot of jewelry in them from the tulip art period because Ottomans were very obsessed with tulips and actually their turbans kind of look like tulips and some of their jewelry has a tulip aesthetic to it. So you kind I feel like you can kind of see that in our headpiece a little bit, like mm -hmm. it has like a jewel drop I they like just, that. yeah it kind of has even like a tulip look to me actually i guess what i could say about their head pieces it, they kind of look like tulips they were very influenced by the tulip 
Um, the, the hair is red because we know her hair is red. The way I created that was just by layering different shades of red, white, brown, until I kind of got what I want to look like red hair. And then I'm going to make this color mink because the Ottomans were really obsessed with mink. And I'm probably going to match the headpiece and the jacket. But in the original Titian painting, she's wearing red. But I decided not to have her wear red because I wanted to show her hair. And the original painting doesn't show her hair. However, there's another painting of her that I have on this book right here. Mm -hmm. And this one kind of shows her hair a little bit. Yeah, it yeah. does. Yeah, but I like that other painting better, the Titian painting. Like, I just mm -hmm. structurally, I like that painting better. This one's kind of darker, and the tones just seem muted. I don't know if that happened over time or if that was just the color palette that particular artist used. So, basically, my whole eye concept is just based on the painting, but I'm tweaking it to my own, you know, interests. Right. Yeah, I remember when we both started out. I still have um, my painting, but it's it's not very good, you know. I liked it though. It was. I thought it was good. I mean, I liked it. I thought that was a fun episode. Yeah, it was a fun episode, and it was pretty early on when I was um, I was just sort of starting out with those, and you know, the one that I did of Anastasia, I I didn't like. I painted over it, but this oh, one did? I kept. Oh, because yeah. I actually did like the Anastasia one, but I understand like that is a way to reuse your canvases. If you don't like how something turned right. out, you can just paint over them. And that's right. the beauty of the canvas, right? Right. Plus, I still have the video of how I painted it. I still have, a, you know, a picture of it. So, yeah, a lot of artists do that, actually. I've that was one of the first things I think I saw on YouTube was this guy. He had one canvas. OK, I think his channel was like one canvas, 365 paintings, because he did a different painting every day, but he would literally paint over the canvas and start again each day. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't do that, you know, but no, I, I, mean, I that's, that's a little excessive, but you could do that if you wanted to. That's just an example. Right. So that's why I decided to go into um, a sketchbook rather than, you know, having to paint over the same canvas over and over again. So, you know, I'll, I showed you some of the paintings, but that one a lot. That's a really yeah. good one. Yeah. I think it's my favorite one from this year so far, really. Yeah, it's one of my favorites too. Yeah. And it's from uh, The Sound of Magic. And this is the girl from The Sound of Magic. And there is our sociologist. Um, it's not that I think this is such a great. I think I did a good job considering, you know, that it was black and white photo. No, I think I you did a really good job. And this is another thing we have to keep in mind, too. Sometimes if we're working from a certain reference photograph, it might be kind of tricky or a weird angle. Like even my sister said one time, she goes, gosh, that's like a really strange, like she said, she knew I wanted to draw this, but it just it was kind of an awkward angle the subject was at. So, you know, you have to remember that, too, especially if it's in black and white and a small picture. It might not be the easiest thing to reconstruct with paint. Right. So this one also was a black and white uh, photo. I, I think maybe from the same era as the sociologist. <laughs> um, but um, that's why some of these don't seem to have a lot of color in them. I mean, of course, I added some color, but they're I not like that though because you know how they used to kind of tint black and white photos it kind of gives me that feeling mm -hmm. yeah that's kind of what it is so yeah and of course i've kept uh most of the paintings that i've painted but i sent one to you i uh, have it actually still i can show everybody it's over here like i a lot of my youtube videos with the cooking videos now i have like a couple paintings in my kitchen that are just like sitting on the counter and i kind of like that because i feel like they all just kind of sit there but we could kind of look at it i can here it is yeah nice to see it again i really I like it. it yeah it's really pretty yeah this was a good photograph too i think i really like that you picked this one yeah uh, yeah, and you know what? Because 
your hair may have been longer, but because I cut it off there, it looks as if it's also appropriate to what it is right now. So yeah, it's about the, I mean, where you cut it off, it really, yeah. I the way we could kind of set it there and we could have it in view. See, <laughs> it right could be a in screen thing. <laughs> right. So what are your plans? Like, do you know what you're going to paint next? Or is it just more like on the day of, like you get the idea for it? Yeah, I, I'm very much influenced right now by what I see. Um, mm -hmm. I see something and it strikes me. I just, I I paint it and I, it doesn't have to be something really pretty, it, but it has to be striking, you know? I think uh, that's, that's a good approach, right? Yeah, yeah. That was something I didn't really like about art classes because you always had to paint like certain things or draw certain things. I hated that. And I get it. It gives you a lot of um, practice at different genres of painting and drawing and whatnot. But I just found it very dull because sometimes I wouldn't want to draw like, oh, like you put a whole bunch of tools together and a stool upside down and backwards, which was just crazy sauce. And we're going to draw that today. I feel like we could have went outside and draw drawn a building and got the same idea. That's just yeah. my feeling on that. Not every art assignment is a good assignment. And I feel like a lot of people were not happy with that particular class. I can tell, oh my gosh. A lot of people were failing that class because they were just so mad at the class. Like I used to do the assignments and just dread them, but other people just would not do them. And then towards them, they're like, well, why are we failing? But yeah, you kind of have to do the assignment. But it was just so absurd all the time. Like what we're doing this next, like in this. And that was the way I felt about art classes. And that's just why I couldn't see myself pursuing a degree in art, you know? Yeah, I understand. You know, uh, I started in on Inktober because uh, a mutual friend of ours, Raven, invited me to that. Oh, I remember. I really do like, is she still posting on Facebook? I haven't seen her lately. Uh, she, she hasn't been in quite a while. I, I kept trying to, you know, talk to her afterwards because I wondered, you know, what her involvement was with Inktober, but she got me involved in that. And I, so I started drawing the, you know, picture a day and I really didn't understand all the politics of Inktober and I didn't understand what it was really about, but I, I just, um, I guess she saw that I sketched something and realized that I liked to draw. And so then after, even though I didn't finish that year, you know, I didn't finish Inktober, um, it got me thinking, yeah, maybe I, I should go back to drawing and painting. I like that you did. I just feel like these challenges like Inktober, they're a little too stressful because they're like one thing every day. And what if you don't have time that day? How do you make time that day? And I used, I did a similar thing. It wasn't with drawing, but it was with blogging, like the A to Z blog challenge. I did it three different years and my results were not very good. Like I met a couple of people that would comment on my things and I kind of like their stuff got, I can't think of anything really good that came out of it. In fact, a weird thing kind of evolved from it where, one of my blogs got de-indexed for a while and I didn't do anything wrong. That was just strange. I don't know. Just weird things happen. So yeah, I, don't, I don't like the, the 30 day challenge and the, the writing challenges. I think, you know, for me, I've always had inspiration to write. Um, mm -hmm. And I didn't need to be told, you know, how many times a day to write or anything like that. And uh, I think it actually cheapens everybody's efforts if they are forced to do it all the time. Yeah, um, I, I so agree. And I mean, I'm not going to say exactly what I'm referring to, but if there's ever like a place or just a, a thing or a certain concept that you have fun and you enjoy as a hobby, sometimes when you do it every day or you go to a certain place, it doesn't have the same magic anymore. And it's kind of bittersweet in a way because like good memories you may have had, not always art related, but it could be art related too, because some people doing art degrees say that they just don't enjoy art anymore once they have to do all these different assignments in an art course, you know? 
Right. And I, you know, I have always thought of myself as a writer, not an artist. Um, yeah, no, you are definitely a writer, but you've done it on your own. You didn't need. Like, yeah. But I was, I was actually reading some blogs of a person that I actually do respect a lot, but she was saying, well, when you're a professional, you have to write when you don't feel like it, uh, when you're not any good at it, when the stuff that you're writing is garbage, that shows you're a professional. And I, I don't, I don't agree with that. Like, I hate that concept. Like, I don't know when we all decided to get together in modern society and say, we need to be defined. Like, maybe I have like really outlier ideas on this, but to be defined by doing something that we don't really like. I don't like, I don't agree with that at all. Why? Yeah, why? I don't, I, you know, and if, 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 uh, if liking what you write means you're an amateur, then I'd rather stay an amateur. <laughs> Well, there's a lot of really good amateur writers who write content, that, books, blogs, things that I actually enjoy reading more than the professional people. And I've told you this before, where there was this novelist. I actually liked her first novel, but the second one was kind of weird and out there. And it turns out she wrote it because, oh, well, her publisher said she had to. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to ever be in a situation like that. I have written quite a number of novels. Each one of them I cared about. Each one of them mattered to me. Um, I'm not saying they can't be improved upon. It would be nice to have an editor who actually cares about my work and wants to help me make it better. I'm not close to that. But uh, I don't want to just write uh, in order to say that I'm a professional, you know. And I also want to have another outlier thought on this, and this is probably unpopular opinion as well, because I know you're a writer, but maybe you agree with me on this. Okay, like now there's these re reading challenges where people are challenging themselves to read like 100 books a year. But I don't really like that because sometimes I want to read one book and really understand mm -hmm. the concepts behind it and go back and research things. And I'm yeah. finding it much more beneficial, especially if you want to be a writer then you might know what you want to write about. I don't know. Like, I don't want to just read a whole bunch of things that I don't enjoy or write. A whole no, bunch I of agree. There, People who become professional readers are also not okay in my book. You know, it's not okay to, to just read something and not enjoy it, not be interested in it and just force yourself to, that would be like force feeding yourself food, you know, when you're not hungry. Yeah. I'd kind of be like the soil. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no. And you know what? I've always been actually a very slow reader. I mean, I don't mean that I have a problem. I have no problem. But you take yeah. your time and you research things, I think, behind what you're reading. You're not just like yes. doing a contest to see like, I read like this many books in a week. Like, Yeah, even when I was in law school and I was a good student at law school, I really actually resented that they wanted us to read so many pages um, every night because I actually enjoyed reading the cases uh, in the case book. But if I was going to really get what they were about, then, you know, it, it needed to be something that I could, you know, sit there and think about for a while. I'm, I feel like it should always be that way. And I feel like we would be learning more writing whatever subject if we really focused on the content more than like how much like quantity versus quality yeah yeah okay well you know what i i think we've pretty much covered everything from painting to writing to everything else um and uh i appreciate your sharing everything with me and hopefully we can do this again next week Definitely. I want, or we're going to paint on your channel next Sunday morning. Yeah. Next, next week we'll do it the other way around. We'll paint on my channel and we'll have a conversation on yours. Well, I look forward to it, Aya. Okay. Good night. Good night.